Hi, I'm Kubis van Rensburg. Join me now for Capturing Glory. We're going to go into the Word of God. We can now all come boldly to the very throne of God, which is the real mercy seat. Right, get your Bibles out. Let's go to Matthew chapter 9, as well as Isaiah chapter 55. We will do Isaiah now and come back to it again later. Right, everybody say, this is God's holy word. Holy men of old wrote, as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Tonight that Holy Spirit will inspire me to understand the word, to hear the word, to bear good fruit on it. And that same anointing will be on the man of God to bring truth tonight that will set people free and perform great miracles. Amen. Right, Isaiah 55, as we've been singing tonight when uh, Morris and them sang, Come, Lord Jesus, come, out of Revelation chapter 22. And uh, that is quoted from Isaiah 55. So when John was on the Isle of Patmos and he had all those great visions of the Lord Jesus, uh, of course the Bible has been written by prophets, prophetic people that was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the same Holy Spirit that spoke to Isaiah spoke to John on the Isle of Patmos. The same Jesus that appeared, appeared there because Isaiah wrote about Jesus when he saw him in his glory in his temple. So Isaiah saw the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in Isaiah 6, I saw the Lord in his holy temple. So in the book of Revelation, John saw the Lord in his holy temple. So they saw the same type of vision. So this is one of the great things that they saw. Isaiah 55, everyone that thirst come to the waters. And he that has no money, okay, you don't have to say a loud amen now, but he that has no money, I mean, especially after the offering, okay, we'll just try again, okay? Everyone that is thirsty, come to the waters, and he that has no money, come buy and come and eat. Now, how do you buy without money? How do you eat without money? I mean, if you go to any place to go and eat and you have no money to pay, they're going to chuck you out or they're going to call the cops to say you stole the food, all right? So you can't eat without money. You can't buy without money. So uh, we've got to understand the context. That this man is really trying to give us something tonight. Come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk. Now, I will not suggest that you go for the wine thing, but, you know, Without money and without price. So it's not just that you don't have money, it's that there is no price on it. In other words, is it so cheap that there's no price on it? Or is it maybe so expensive that there's no price on it? You know, and so many times we take the things of God so cheaply. We just take it, you know, for granted that God is just going to do a lot of things for us. And many times when it's without price, it's not because it's so cheap. It's that you will not be able to afford it. So you've got to understand, without, without price and without cost, it's not necessarily that it's so cheap that it's just lying around on the streets. It's so expensive, you can't afford it. You can't pay for it. You can't do anything to get it. So I got to understand, how can I get stuff that is too costly for me? This is what I want us to see tonight, okay? It says, wherefore do you spend your money for which is not bread, and your labor for which does not satisfy? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in the fatness. So the context is, the fatness is the anointing. It's only the anointing that can truly satisfy you. All right? And that is so costly, you can't buy it. 
You can't pay for it. There's nothing that you can give to get the anointing. You've got to understand what Isaiah is trying to tell us. What? We labor so much, you know, and at the end of the day, the stuff that you labored for does not really satisfy you. When, when you come to a place where a sick bed hits you or death stares you in the face, everything around you doesn't count anything, doesn't mean anything. You can have the best cars in your driveway. You can have the biggest paintings on your walls. You can have the thickest rugs on your beds. But when something faces you or stares you in the face, that you know comes to to grab your health or something like that doesn't mean a thing so we labor for stuff that does not really satisfy us the only thing that can truly satisfy you is the anointing of the holy spirit the presence of the lord jesus christ is the only deep thing that will bring you true peace and joy and happiness verse 3 says incline your ear and come unto me hear and your soul shall live and I will make, now, now, uh, now, why must your soul live? Remember when God breathed on man in the garden, man stood up a living soul. And through the years, that is the thing that is troubling man is his soul life. When Jesus came in Matthew chapter 11, you know, verse 28, he said, come unto me, all ye who labor. He says, why do you labor? And I heavy laden. Why are you stressed down? Come unto me, learn of me. I'm gentle of heart, I'm meek, and you will find rest for your souls. And I tell you, there's very few people that really have rest in their souls. People are troubled, people are stressed up, people are anxious, people are filled with fear. Everything is trying to steal your soul peace. Ask me, I can tell you many stories. Everything will try to stole steal your soul peace but if you have peace in your soul you know nothing 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 will to be too big for you to face in this world you can face anything if you that's why the bible every time he talks about the anointing he doesn't talk about your spirit your spirit is already anointed because your spirit is anointing you know if he says the spirit is upon me it's the anointing is upon me the holy spirit is automatically anointed Okay, but my soul needs anointing. That's why every time he says, I will restore your soul, not your spirit. I will refresh your soul. I will revive your soul. And then he comes over and over. He says, he will restore and refresh the souls with the fatness. So the anointing is there to quicken your soul, man, so that your soul will be alive. When you are down, it's your soul that's down. When you are stressed up, it's your soul that's stressed up. When you are anxious, it's your soul that's anxious. Your spirit, man, is high, man. It just needs to be lifted up by your soul, man. And your body gets tired because your soul is tired. So what do we need? We need refreshing of our souls. Now, uh, I, I hope we're going to get somewhere here tonight. But verse 3 says, Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live. How many times does the word of the Lord says, If you have an ear to hear, hear. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of God. David. Everybody say the mercies of David. So that is where we're going to stand for a few minutes tonight. God help us and see where we're going to get. So uh, your soul, every person in this house and every person watching by satellite, your soul needs to be refreshed. Your soul needs peace and joy and happiness. Your soul is the one that's supposed to live. Because that's what happened in the book of Genesis. When God breathed on man, he became a living soul. And through the ages, that's the thing that Satan wants to destroy, religion wants to destroy, people want to destroy, is that soul peace in the heart of man. So the only thing that will make that soul of yours to live is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now God gives us a clue how we're going to get the anointing to bring us into a place where our soul will live. He said, by the sure mercies of David. Why? Because David is the man that kept on constantly talking about, he restores my soul. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. David is the man who understood God is a merciful God. All right? Matthew chapter 9. Right or wrong, it's still right. Huh? Matthew chapter, ah, I wonder if we should read the whole chapter 9. How long is it? It's not too long. We can read the whole chapter 9. Are you ready for a lot of reading tonight? Somebody needs to help. Just help me. Just say amen or yes or pray for me or something. In Luke chapter 18, two people came to the temple to pray. The one was a publican and the one was a Pharisee. The Pharisee came and said, oh Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this publican. I thank you, Lord, that I pay my tithes. 
I thank you that all my bills are paid. I thank you that I fast regularly. I thank you that I never miss a meeting. I thank you that I'm in every prayer meeting, at every choir practice. Lord, I thank you that I'm always at the door ushering. Oh, Lord, I thank you that I do everything that's right in the sight of the Most High God. And everything he said was good and everything is what God expects from you. The publican came and he did not even lift up his eyes to heaven. He just beat on his own chest and he said, Oh Lord, be merciful to me. And Jesus said, Who do you think went away justly and righteous? He said, Not the first one, but the second one. You know, so it's an attitude of heart that makes you justified and righteous with God. God said, The guy that said, I pay my tithes, I'm at every choir practice, I never miss a meeting. God says, You know, that man actually missed it. But the other guy said, Oh Lord, be merciful to me. God says, Well, that man is just. Okay? So everybody say, Mercy. Mercies, tender mercies, merciful. I hope that word will fall somewhere in somebody's heart tonight, even if it's just mine. And, uh, but, you know, when it comes to revival, I, I said it a couple of years ago, and I said it again last year at the pastor's conference. And this year, Tom came and just, you know, just laid such emphasis on that word. Every revival started with people understanding God's mercy. Every revival stopped when people started getting judgmental. Every revival started when people had a revelation of mercy. Every revival stopped when people started getting judgmental. In other words, judgment comes when you start getting legalistic. When you go back to the law of Moses. When you go back to the Judaizing of Christianity. Instead of living in the free grace that God has given, people want to become Jews again. They want to have the rituals of the Judaizers. And Paul says, you know, the Judaizers are dogs. They will eat you up. They will devour the good stuff that God has brought to you. And here is, here is the proof. You know, there was a man by the name of Jonah. What happened to Jonah? Okay, everybody knows the fish swallowed him. But he did some other stuff too. It's not only the fish that swallowed him. You know, he did preach to Nineveh, you know. But Jonah was a prophet. And God, God said to him, Jonah, get and go to the great city Nineveh and preach and say, within 40 days, I will destroy you. Remember the story? And Jonah didn't want to listen to God, remember? And there was a storm on the sea. And, you know, they said, you know, there must be a God that is angry. At the end, they decided Jonah threw him over. Big fish came, swallowed him, you know, three days, three nights in the belly of the fish. You know, I don't know how he survived, but my goodness. I think he died because the Bible said, out of the depths of hell, I cried unto you and you heard me in your holy temple. You know? And the Bible says, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, you know, belly of the fish three days, so the Son of Man must be in the belly of the earth for three days. But after three days, long story short, here comes the fish, wow, there goes Jonah, you know, and uh, he starts preaching, you know, and God speaks to him, he said, now go to that city in Nineveh and preach to them. Here's Jonah, I mean, repent, you would have too, I mean, look what the man looked like. I mean, I wonder what he looked like after three days in the belly, you know, so if, if somebody like that appears to me, I would repent right there. But in any case, three days, three nights, so here comes Jonah and he says, within 40 days, this city will be destroyed. That's his message. He's not a prophet of joy and happiness. He's a prophet of doom. He doesn't come to prophesy God is bringing joy to the city. He's coming to prophesy God's bringing judgment to the city. He's not bringing good news of everybody's going to ride new mercs and he does not bring a prophecy that everybody's going to stay in three-story houses. He says, within 40 days, get your house in order. God will destroy the city. The end of chapter 3 going into chapter 4, the Bible says, And God repented of the evil that he was going to do to Nineveh, because the people prayed this way. Who knows? Who knows if we will turn to God, if he will not turn from the evil and be merciful to us and not do what he's planned to do. Then God came to Jonah, his prophet. I mean, this is now not a fortune teller. This is God's man for the hour. God's man of power for the hour. He's ready here to bring in the glory of God in the city of Nineveh. So uh, here comes God and he says, well, Jonah, what do you think? The Bible says, and Jonah got very angry. And he said, this is not right. You got me. 
said, I told you before I came to Nineveh that if I come and preach destruction, you will turn and be merciful and then I will be the baboon. <laughs> More or less. You know, he didn't use the words baboon, but if I think he could have used a rougher word than that. But this is more or less what Jonah said. He said, God, I knew before I came to Nineveh that if I come and preach destruction, you will turn and show mercy. And you're, because you are merciful, you will not do what you told to do. And then I would look ugly. God says, are you angry because I don't want to destroy them? Are you angry because I'm merciful towards my people? Now, that same sentence, not even different punctuation, is used in the book of Joel chapter 2, where he says, if we return to the Lord, who knows if he will not be merciful and come to us again and pour out his Holy Spirit. So a revival is people that understands a merciful God that's about to pour out his mercy on a lot of people that don't deserve mercy. You know, what is mercy? We all love grace. Oh, grace, grace. By grace, I'm saved. Amazing grace. We all love the grace message. But how much do we know about the mercy message? Hmm? And I'm serious tonight. How much do we know about mercy? Grace is... You don't deserve it, but take it in any case. Mercy says, you deserve to die. But I'll set you free. Grace says, you don't deserve to get this, but take the present in any case. Mercy says, you deserve to die, but I'll set you free. I'll try it once more to see if anybody will get it. Grace says, you don't deserve this, but take it in any case. Mercy says, you deserve to die, but I'll set you free. So in times of war, you know, somebody comes around the corner and somebody's got an AK-47 against his head. And the guy's, mercy! Hey, you got the wrong uniform on. You're on the wrong side. I can see on your cap and on your shoulder, you belong to the enemy. Ah! The guy, mercy! Run! That's mercy. Okay? So God comes to you and they say, Hey, you ugly, horrible sinner. Look what you do to my grace. You don't take what I give you freely. I want to give you salvation. I want to give you healing. I want to give you everything for free. You don't, you don't deserve it. Go and take it in any case. <laughs> Somebody will get it sometime. That's mercy. Okay? So mercy. So God says, If you are thirsty... You don't, money can't do it. There's no price to pay for it. The only thing you need to understand, if you really want the stuff that God has to give, God says, understand that I'm going to bring to you the sure mercies of David. Now tonight we're going to go for that. So go to the book of Matthew chapter 9 and let's trust God to really speak to somebody in the house. And that's you. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy. Now, if you were at the pastor's conference, we did that in, you know, in another book, you know, where it was really, there was, they made room for Jesus. Okay? And Jesus said, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, now listen to what he says to him, your sins are forgiven you. Okay, this is more than just grace. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves. Now, they didn't talk. They just thought. This man blasphemes. Jesus, knowing their thoughts. So they were just thinking. They didn't say anything. Wherefore, think ye evil in your hearts. I don't know if we should stop here and pause a little while. And you, you may sit in a meeting like this, and you then in your house, you may be going to church services. No, it's all right to sit here and go out and say something. But you know God knows what you're thinking while you're sitting. He doesn't wait till you say what you thought. He knows exactly what you're thinking now. You know, so he, Jesus, whenever he's, he said, he knew their thoughts. And he said, why do you reason in your hearts? You know how many times Jesus said to the Pharisees, why do you reason in your hearts? Why do you reason in your hearts? In other words, people say, mm, can this truly be? Is this right? What he's doing is right. Because don't sit and reason. 
You are missing something so awesome and we're going to go for that year tonight. Okay? Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? What is easier to say, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. I say, rise, take up your bed and go to your house. He arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house. Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Now remember the prayer in the temple. In Luke chapter 18. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go and learn what it means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Okay? Go and learn what it means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. He's telling it immediately after he said unto the man, your sins are forgiven. Immediately after he said to the man, take up your bed and walk. Immediately after he ate with the publicans and the sinners. You know, they were, hey, how can he forgive sins? How can he say rise up and walk? How can he eat with the wrong crowd? Jesus said, go learn what it means. I want mercy. Okay, let's try it once more. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Go, take up your bed and walk. Now he eats with the wrong crowd ah, at the wrong stake. Ah, 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 yeah. Jesus, hey, hey, go learn. Go learn what it means. I will have mercy and not your sacrifices. So you can't pay for the thing that I want to give you. The thing that I want to give you, you deserve not to get it, but I'm going to give it to you because you don't deserve it. And that is, I want to be merciful unto you. So, we're going to go, we're going to get somewhere. So, I trust. So, okay, verse 18. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay your hand upon her as she shall live. Jesus arose, followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him, touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. Now, I want you to follow chapter 9 of Matthew. Your sins are forgiven. Take up your bed, go home. Eat with the wrong crowd. Your faith is made you all. I mean, what a chapter, man. And all the time, the Pharisees are there to, oh, yeah, when I, yeah. Yo, yo, yeah. Okay. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house, he saw the minstrels and the people making a noise. And he said, give place for the maid is not dead, but sleep. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand. And the maid rose and the fame thereof went abroad into all that land. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him crying, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. Okay, this is the place where I thought somebody's going to just go bananas berserk and jump out of your chairs or do something. Now, the same thing happened there in Matthew chapter 20 and the same thing happened there in Mark chapter 10. Now, Mark chapter 10 puts it a bit more direct. It says, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting at the wayside begging. And as he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was coming by, he started shouting, Jesus! Okay, I'm very lonely, but I'll do it in any case. Jesus, it's a one-man act, so don't worry. Jesus, there's no audience, so don't worry. It's a one-man act, so I'll just play it off. I'm exercising. Jesus, okay, he's now blind, okay. Son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowds come and say, shh, hey, chula hey. Shh, you know, and they say, Jesus is busy, you know. And the Bible says, he cried even the louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
So there we have it, Mark, oh, Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 20, Mark chapter 10, three different occasions, people and the Syrophoenician woman, Jesus, son of David. Every time that they said, son of David, they added a word. Have mercy. And every time Jesus stopped and said, as you have believed. He didn't have to pray for them. He didn't have to heal them. He didn't have to perform a miracle. They got a miracle by getting a revelation, Jesus said. Through his apostles and through his prophets. You know, there we have the apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. Here we have the prophet, you know, uh, Isaiah in chapter 55. He says, if you are thirsty, there's stuff that you can't buy. There's stuff that has got no price to it. It's too big. The only way you can get it is understanding the sure mercies of David. The mercies of David. Okay, you've got to understand this tonight because when I get to the message, it's going to be really great here tonight. Okay, so here comes Jesus. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Your sins are forgiven. Eat with the wrong crowd. The Pharisees, hey man, hey, what, I like, no, no, I, I, no. Hey, what is he doing? He's doing the wrong stuff. She said, hey, why don't you go and learn? Just learn one sentence. I want mercy. I don't want your sacrifices. If you understand my mercy, you will understand anything that you ever wanted on this life because you deserve to die, but I'm going to set you free. I'm going to liberate you. I'm going to make you whole. I'm going to bless you with anything and everything you want on this earth. Maybe, maybe I should just jump in you, you know. I said, every revival starts with an understanding of mercy. It stops with judgment and the law. Huh? So keep your finger there. We're still busy in Matthew chapter 10. But have you heard this? You know, especially the deliverance crowd. May God forgive you. Oh, God will, you know, visit the iniquities of the fathers to the second and the third generation. And then we go for bloodline curses. Oh, did your, did your mother ever went to a fortune teller? Did your father ever play the huja board? Did your mother go to a sangoma? No, she is one. You know, yeah, you know, and we have all this stuff. Have you ever heard that? And people go and they try their best to show why people are cursed. You know, and the scripture they use is Exodus 20. I'm the Lord your God that took you out of the land of Egypt, you know, and I'm going to visit the, you know, all the wrong to the... Let's read Exodus 20 before we go back to Matthew chapter 9. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God. Now, I'm reading this now to you. Who has brought you out of the land of Egypt? Out of the house of bondage. Okay, I want more to shout. God is starting to say, I am the Lord that brought you out. Of the land of Egypt. I'm the God that brought you out of your bondage. Okay? Now, he doesn't start with, you shall not, you shall, you shall. First, he said, I brought you out. I took you out. I took you away from bondage. I took you out. If you see this, man, the rest is going to be peanuts. Okay? If you like peanuts. If you don't like peanuts, it's going to be popcorn. If you don't like popcorn, make it honey. Okay, anything. Just whatever you like, put it in there. Hmm? Then he comes and he says, you shall have no other gods before me. Or beside me. Now listen to this one. You shall make yourself. You shall not make yourself any graven image. Oh, Corbus, what's a crucifix doing in your church? Oh, to worship it. Okay, okay, forget that. That is just for the people that struggle. Or any likeness of anything that's in the heavens above or the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them. You shall not serve them. Okay, I just want to help a few people that's got a problem with a few images, you know. They will not have a crucifix, but they carry a photo of their girlfriend in their wallet. <laughs> they will not have a crucifix, but they've got an eagle on their desk. They've got the big five on their wall. Okay, forget that. <laughs> they honor the big five. There's more big fives sold in one year than crucifixes in 10 years um, people worship they carry those stuff in their pockets all day long south african money is full of idols <laughs> they've got buffaloes on elephants on you know look at that buffaloes elephants lions you know leopards yo south africa's in trouble man 
Verse 5. You shall not bow down yourself to them to serve them. Listen, here it comes. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. Okay? So the word hate is a key word, and the generations only goes up to maximum fourth. Are you ready? Verse 6. But showing mercy to thousand generations of those who love me. Oh, come on. Somebody need to shout. Huh? Isn't that funny how people will drill it into you that God will visit the iniquities of the fathers to the second and the third generation? Then they skip the word hate. Then they never even touch on the mercy side, which is for a thousand generations. To anybody who loved me. So if somebody somewhere loved God for thousands of generations, His mercy will still follow that group of people. So I can't think that all your forefathers were devils. I mean, somewhere there must have been a Pope in your family. (laughs) Some priest. (laughs) That's all right. Let's go. Matthew 9. We're going on with Matthew 9. Hmm? Son of David. That's where we were when we were interrupted. Okay. Verse 27. We were interrupted by that blind man. Yeah, Mark chapter 10, he interrupted the whole crowd when he cried, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. Okay. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said, Believe you that I am able to do this? They said, Yes, Lord. He touched their eyes and said, According to your faith. What faith? That he has mercy because he's the son of David. Their eyes were open and Jesus straightly charged him, See that no man know it. How on earth are you going to keep that quiet? But when they departed, spread it abroad the fame. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> and as they went out, behold, they brought him a dumb man possessed with the devil. That's bad. He's a devil and he can't tell who the devil is. <laughs> That'll help a few people with deliverance. What's your name? Just for the people that's in the deliverance ministry. I mean, it'll be bad to have a devil-possessed guy that's dumb, you know. He said, this man is dumb and he had a devil. He said, who are you? (laughs) What? What? Where are you from? (laughs) Just for those who understand deliverance. I mean, they can't drive out a devil if he doesn't speak. Now, here's this guy. He's dumb and he has a devil. You're in problem. There goes your ministry. This guy can't help you. (laughs) Ah, forgive us, dear Father. (laughs) I see the picture. Ah, I see the picture. I mean, we started our ministry in Natal amongst the Hindus, brother. I tell you every devil, who are you? My name is Kali. Kali, where are you from? I'm from India. What are you doing here? I snort with my... Elephant knows I. <laughs> How can you drive out a devil if he's dumb? I don't know if anybody does, you know, appreciate that. But I just thought tonight. I this is the first time I saw this picture. We we'll have to write this letter to the deliverance crowd and say, "What will you do with the devil if he's dumb? What's your name? What?" I know that's not good preaching, but I, I just saw the picture. I can't help. I, I, it took me back 30, 20 years ago or so, you know. Who are you? I am Lucifer. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't even such a person. Okay. And when the devil, let's go back to the message. Don't switch your TV off. We haven't started preaching yet. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. That's good. <laughs> so it's the devil that made him dumb. So the devil didn't want to speak, the stupid thing. And the multitude, don't worry about that. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He caused out devils through the prince of devils. 
And Jesus went about all the cities, villages, teaching in their synagogues, teaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness, every disease amongst the people. He healed every sickness and every disease amongst the people. I just wanted to read the whole chapter 9 to show you how many times the people reasoned, argued, battled, and every time Jesus just threw one thing on the table, mercy. And then he added a word, David's mercy. The sure mercies of David. Because that's what Isaiah 55 says. You can come by without price, without money. You can come get whatever you need. The stuff that will really satisfy and give life to your soul has got no price tag. It's too expensive. You haven't got money. You haven't got enough. The only way is you've got to understand mercy. I mean, how much do we know about grace? Just about everything. We've been singing for 300 years. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Saved someone like me. You know, we need to change that song. We need to sing it like you. You know, <laughs> because we love grace for ourselves. But what about having some grace for the next person? You know? But understanding grace doesn't take you all the way. What about mercy? Grace is get, 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 get. Mercy is go, go, go. Mercy is, you're healed, you're free, delivered, go, you're whole. Nothing can keep you back, nothing can stop you now. That's mercy. Grace is, you want? Get it, take it, take it, take it. Mercy is, go, go. you get it as we go on tonight, you're going to get it, okay? So let's go to the book of Psalms and see the mercies of David. And on the way back to Psalms, stop at Isaiah 16, I think. Just a pit stop there. On the way back. I mean, we are in reverse now. Ooh, man. I think I must throw this one in. You go to Psalm 69. When you got your finger in Psalm 69, you, you stop at the pit stop for some oil. <coughs> Psalm 69. Whoa, well, man. Bless you, my father. What was David? A king? Okay. Now the Bible says of David, he will establish his throne forever. If you read Acts chapter 2, but it says David died. How can his throne be established forever? But he's talking about the seed of David. Now it says Jesus is the seed of Abraham, but Jesus is the seed of David. Okay. But Jesus is the seed of God. Okay. So we've got to understand the whole thing. So on the way there, just stop at Isaiah 16. I just thought I'll throw this one in. He says in verse 5, In mercy and loving kindness shall a throne be established, and one shall sit upon it in truth and faithfulness in the tent of David, judging and seeking justice and being swift to do righteousness. Oh man, somebody will get this tonight. Somebody will get this tonight. God says, The day will come when... Oh, spoke before. The day will come... No, yeah. Say amen or I spit again. You can be glad I'm not in the front row now. You could have all be healed. Okay. God says, the day will come when I will establish my throne. And the throne will be a throne of mercy. Let's put it on the next board. I, I want What is it? In mercy will my throne be established. I love that. Especially the end time preachers that preach so much about the judgment throne. Scare everybody to death. Oh, when you stand in front of God's judgment throne, what will you say? Mercy. Right. Okay, let's just go to Psalm 69. <laughs> well, it fell here and there like, you know, popcorn on a hot plate or something. But... <laughs> Okay, to the chief musician, said to the tune of lilies. Ah, Lily. Is your name Lily? <laughs> Sing us a song, Lily. Okay. Save me, O God. Now, listen to the words that he used because we're going to pick it up in another psalm. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there's no foothold. I've come into deep waters where the floods overwhelm me. I'm weary with my crying. 
My throat is parched. My eyes fail with waiting for my God. I hope you're not there now, but you know. Those who hate me, if you are there now, I've got good news for you. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Yes, Aklom. Those who would cut me off and destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully, are many and mighty. I am forced to restore what I did not steal. Oh God, you know my folly, you know my blundering, my sins and my guilt are not hidden from you. He first starts over the enemies, then he goes to himself. Oh Lord, my enemies are wicked. Oh Lord, but if I look at me, I'm more, even more wicked. You know? Did you see that? Waters are all around me. God, I can't come out. Okay? Now, I know you're not there every day, but have you ever been there? Hmm? Do you know somebody that's there? Okay, are you there now? Okay, uh, so there, there's stuff that sometimes come a person's way. Verse 12. They who sit in, this is bad news, man. They who write the you, I mean, they who sit in the city's <laughs> gates, talk about me, and I'm the song of the drunkards. <laughs> How would you like to pass the pub and they sing your name? You know? <laughs> I know they do it a lot about that guy whose name is Furi. Furi Sejoli, good fellow, Furi Sejoli. You know, but... <laughs> How would they like if they sing your name in the pub? <laughs> How would you like okay, verse 12. They who sit in the gate talk about me. I'm the song of the drunkards. You see, like when I was here, so. But as for me, listen to this. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable Listen to the words because when it kind of pick on that right at the end of the message. And an acceptable and opportune time, O oh God, in the multitude of your mercy and in the abundance of your loving kindness, hear me. Truth and faithfulness of your salvation, answer me. What does this guy say? He says, God, my enemies are more than the hair on my head. I don't know if he was bald. Maybe he was, you know. Oh, here help my why do I see such a rubbish? But, I mean, this guy says, imagine he must have had a thick bush of hair because uh, my enemies. Then he goes, people sing about me in the pubs. When they drunk, it's my name that they sing about, Lord. But apart from that, Lord, I'm miserable. I'm wicked. Look at the stuff I've done. But, oh God, no matter my enemies, no matter what I did, I just want to ask, will you see me in your mercy? I want to pray not because of what they're doing. I don't want to pray because of what I'm doing. I just want to come and ask for mercy tonight. This is David. Now what's he going to restore? The sure mercies of David. What do the people cry in the streets? Son of David. What must he do? Have mercy. What happened? Free. Oh, if you can only go and learn, I want mercy and not sacrifices. Okay? We're going to get to it. Rescue me out of the mire, verse 14. Let me not sink. You know, like, you know, Peter, you know, on the water, starting to sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and from the deep waters. Let not the flood waters overflow and overwhelm me. Neither let the deep swallow me up, nor dug a pit for me. Close his mouth over me. Hear and answer me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is sweet and comforting. Listen, according to your plenteous tender mercy and steadfast love, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Oh, answer me speedily. Everybody say, speed it up, Lord. No, you say, no, 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 Lord. You know, oh, God, teach me patience. Just do it quickly. No, uh, it's all right. This David guy says, oh, Lord, I don't want this answer tomorrow because then I'll be gone. I'm already sinking. I'm already under. The waters are already around me. It's everything is already too much for me. God, would you put some speed in the answer? Okay, now I see a few faces in here. You can't even hear us over proof. You can't do this to God, tell him to speed it up, you know? Hmm? Okay, if you are crossing the railway line, and your car just bombs out when you're on the line and here comes the locomotive. Do you think God must answer you in three days? When do you need the answer? Oh. So don't you think that sometimes you say, 
Oh God, I need it, but I need it like in yesterday. This guy says, oh God, would you speed it up? But he knows how to put pressure on God. According to your mercy, would you answer me speedily? According to your mercy. In other words, I know that you've got something in your heart, oh God, that is called a merciful God. He must have read the book. Remember when God came to Moses and said, Allow me and I will destroy these wicked, hard-headed, stiff-necked Israelites. And Moses said, Ah, ah, show your power. Comma, by being merciful. God said, ah, then I can't destroy them. He said, got you. Try it once more. Numbers 14. God says, Moses, I will destroy these people. Because their heart is... Moses said, show your power, comma, by being merciful. God said, then I can't destroy them. Because you touch on something that is indestructible, that will not destroy, that is mercy. He says, uh, thank you, Lord. Come on. It happened over and over in Samuel's days, in Jehoshaphat's days, in Solomon's days, in David's days. Whenever there was any calamity, war or pestilence, the only thing that they did is they sang, the Lord is good and his mercies are everlasting. And then God showed up. He said, somebody called mercy. Huh? So I'm here to set you free. I'm here to deliver you. I'm here to take you out. I'm here to set you free. I'm here to make you whole. I'm here to bless you. You can't touch on my mercy and not get an answer speedily. God never delayed when they called on his mercy. Okay. So let's go to Psalm 18. We've read it now. In my distress. Oh, answer me speedily. Is that right? Now you've heard the sayings, you heard the enemies, you heard his own trouble. And Psalm 18, we touched this week in the pastor's conference, but tonight's a little bit deeper, and I trust it's going to bless you tremendously. The, 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 the title says, The Day When God Delivered David from All His Enemies. How would you like to be, de- how would you, would you like to be delivered from all your enemies and get some water to drink? <laughs> My soul thirsts. <laughs> Are you alright? I hope it's, I hope we're doing something right here tonight. Yeah. Psalm eighteen. He says, "I love you fervently and devotedly, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer." I want you to get the word there because of what we touched on. My deliverer. My God, my keen and firm strength in whom I will trust and take refuge. My shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The cords or bands of death. Now here is Psalm 69. See it. The cords and bands of death surrounded me. The streams of ungodliness and the torrents of ruin terrified me. Is this Psalm 69? The cords of Sheol. Surrounded me, the snares of death confronted and came upon me. Is this Psalm 69? It's all the same. In my distress. Is this Psalm 69? Come and help me, preachers. In my distress, when see me close, I called upon the Lord. I cried to my God. He heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry came before him into his very ears. So where is God? On a throne. Just get that picture, okay? Isaiah 66 says, The heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. So if God is the ruler of the universe, God is enthroned on a seat of mercy. Now it says in Isaiah 16, I will establish my throne in mercy and in righteousness. So God wants the throne. So David says, I cried and God is in his holy temple. In other words, the temple was depicted as having a throne. He says, and my cries came into the very ears of God. You know, most people's cries goes to the ceiling. I'll just stop and pause there for a while. You know, because I pray, but my prayers never go further than the ceiling. This guy's cries went right into God's ears. Like, who's crying there? You know? okay. Forget it. So. Okay. Now, don't let me lose you. When you pray, where's your prayers going to? Is it reaching God? 
If it reaches God, it must be answered. If it's not answered, it didn't reach God. So how can it reach God? God is not bound by space and time. So what hinders me from getting answers to prayer? Small little secrets that we are touching on tonight. Just a little understanding of God is not there to kill you, judge you, condemn you. God is there to show mercy towards you. God is merciful. If you pray and you haven't got the mercifulness of God towards Him, towards you in your heart, write your prayer down and say, I'll come again next week. Okay, I'll try it once more. I haven't got you right now. If your prayers are directed to God and you haven't got an understanding of God's mercy, write your prayer down and say, I'll come again next week. The minute you understand God's mercy, I promise you tonight, on God's word, if you get an understanding of God's mercy, you'll start seeing answers to praise. They speedily, speedily, speedily. What did God say? He answered me. He delivered me from all my enemies. How long did Moses cry before God answered? Immediately. What did they pray? Mercy. Every time they acknowledge mercy, God just stepped in on the scene. Let's just try it. Psalm 18. Let's read slowly. Okay. My cries came into the very ears of God. Now listen how he describes, we did it about a couple of weeks ago. This is how he pictures God. Then the earth quaked and rocked. The foundations of the mountains trembled. They moved and were shaken because he was indignant and angry. Okay, let's try it again. I know, I know everybody hasn't got an imagination. But tonight I pray that God will help you with an imagination. I mean... There's people that watch Shrek and does, is not moved at all. I pray for you. There's people that will sit hours and watch anything and come out and not be touched. Okay, So if you're not touched by Winnie the Pooh, Shrek or anything like it, I really pray for you tonight that God will do something to your imagination. You know? But this guy, David, must have had some kind of an imagination. He said, I cried unto God. Waters was all around me. I was in the bonds of death. It was like I was choking. I couldn't breathe anymore. My enemies were more than the hairs of my head. My own iniquities were so many, and they were before God. And I knew, oh, man, you are so wicked. You are, you are condemned. You are judged. You are wicked. You are evil. He said, all this stuff was right upon me. Then I cried unto the Lord. And I said, be merciful and answer me speedily according to your mercy. He said, when I touched on his mercy, my cries came into his ears. And this is what I saw. Okay, now try and imagine, please. I've been over the mountains. I've slain the dragons. I've fought the door. And I've been into the deer. Okay, Shrek 2. Okay, but then the earth quaked. Okay, let's go. And rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled. They moved and were shaken because he was indeed. Then went up smoke from his nostrils. Lightning out of his mouth. Devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode upon a cherub. And he flew. Yes, he sped on with the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret hiding place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Out of the brightness before him, they broke forth uh, through his thick clouds, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered from the heavens. The Most High uttered his voice amid hailstones and... Ah, no man. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and put them to root. Then the beds of the sea appeared. The foundation of the world were laid bare oh at the rebuke of the Lord at the blast of the breath of his nostrils he reached from high he took me and he drew me out of the waters <laughs> ah he delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated and abhorred me and they were too strong for him they confronted and came upon me in the day of my calamity but the Lord was my stay and support he brought me forth also into a large place he was delivering me because he was pleased with me and delighted in me the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness according to the cleanness of my hands for I have kept the ways for all the ordinances were there verse 23 I was upright before him and blamed with him ever to keep myself free from my sin and guilt. Verse 24 Therefore the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness according to the cleanness of my hands. Verse 25 Because with a kind and merciful you will show yourself kind and merciful. Hmm. 
Oh, I don't know if I should go on, but uh, I mean, you can you can read the rest if you want to for homework. Come on. I'll somebody say amen. amen. I mean, even if it's the only time in your life you're going to say amen in church, you know, it's not the end of the prayer. Just say amen. My heart agrees with the word. How would you like to get such a picture of your God? You say, Lord, I, I've got a pain right here. And it's been sitting there for two weeks. In your great mercy. Oh God. I know I messed up there. That guy is against me. I couldn't pay my debts there. I cursed that one. That one cursed me. But oh God because of your mercy. Would you just take the pain away. And whew, The oceans open up. Hailstones come. Lightning bolts swing around. Smoke devour. Nostrils. Hailstones and brimstone and fire. Wah, and here comes God. Jump, free. I, I don't know. I'll just plan. But this is what David said. This is a picture he got of God that's about to deliver you. If you understand mercy. <laughs> God answers to mercy like... Oh Let's go back to Isaiah 55. Did you get that? Man, man, man. May God help us tonight. Isaiah 55. We can go on as long as we want to because the whole book is full of mercy. The pity is people never understood the mercy thing. Mercy. Isaiah 55. Everyone that is thirsty, I hope you're going to understand it now. Come to the waters, and he that has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend your money for which is not bread? You labor for that which does not satisfy. Hearken diligently to me and eat that which is good. Let your soul delight itself in the fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even the sure mercies of David. Now let's go to Acts chapter 13. Jesus. Come on. Son of David. Have mercy. On me. Come on everybody. Jesus. Son of David. Have mercy. On me. Mm -hmm. Where are we going to start this, man? But let's start at verse 32. We are bringing you, I'm reading Amplified, we are bringing you the good news. That what God promised to our forefathers. This he has, I want you to take this, completely fulfilled. Everybody say completely fulfilled. He completely fulfilled it. For us, their children, by raising up Jesus as it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. You should read Hebrews 1 and 2 with it. Verse 34. And as to his having raised him from among the dead, now mo no more return to putrefaction and dissolution. He spoke in this way, I will fulfill and give to you the holy and sure mercies. Of David. Oh, come on. He says, they preaching now. They say the fact that Jesus is risen. Everything is now fulfilled that was ever promised to our forefathers. And this is the fulfillment. I will bring you the sure mercies of David. Come on. I, I mean, if it doesn't bring anything to you. He says, you know what is the total fulfillment of everything that has ever been promised to any of our forefathers? The mercies of David. By Jesus being resurrected from the dead. That is it. I thought you were going to go bananas here. For this reason, it says also in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Verse 36. For David, after he had served God's will and purpose and counsel in his own generation, fell asleep. I don't know, it's video. Verse 37. But he... Yeah, it was a Bible fog for now than he can. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Verse 38. So let it be clearly known and understood by you, brethren, that through this man, forgiveness, here it comes, and removal of sins is now proclaimed to you. Hey, 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 well. 
You could listen now. How many believe their sins are forgiven? Good. How many believe it's removed? If it's removed, why a remembrance? We believe it's forgiven. But do we really believe it's removed? You know, that's what David said in Psalm 18. Now we talk about the sure mercies. He said, I have, what does he say? Remove myself from my iniquity. In other words, I, yeah, he doesn't think of it. Yeah, there is no remembrance. It's not just I'm forgiven. I'm, it has been removed. Well, maybe, maybe you'll get it during the course of the night. But, uh, you know, verse 39 says, And that through him everyone who believes is absolved from every charge, from which he could not be justified and freed by the law of Moses and given right standing with God. Hmm. It's too much. I'll read it to you in another book. You know this one, but don't go there. I want to read it to you. Therefore, there is now no condemnation, no judging guilty or wrong. For those who are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the dictates of the flesh, which is the law, but after the dictates of the spirit, which is the New Testament. For the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being, has freed me from the law of sin and of death. Verse 3. For God has done what the law could not do. Because its power being weakened by the flesh, the entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit, sending his own son in the guise of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, God condemned sin in the flesh. God subdued sin. God overcame sin. God deprived it of its power over all who will accept that sacrifice. Wow. So I read it to you again in Acts chapter 13. So let it be clearly known, verse 38, and understood by you, brethren, that through this man, forgiveness and removal of sin is now proclaimed to you. That is the mercies of David. And that through him, this is it, everyone who believes, who acknowledges Jesus as his Savior and devotes himself to him, please get this, is absolved, cleared, freed from every charge. From which you could not be justified and freed by the law of Moses and given right standing with God. Do you want to know what he calls it? Mercy. Come on, somebody clap. Mercy. Mercy says, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. Even if you didn't do it, you're still guilty just because of who you came from. Even if you didn't do anything wrong, you're still guilty because you were not a Jew. <laughs> Even if you did, you're still guilty because your forefathers didn't say. You are guilty no matter how you look. So he says, but I want to bring mercy. That means you are freed from anything you could never be set free from. No matter how you brought sacrifices, you could never be told. Now mercy comes and says, Phew. you're free. Huh? Not just free. I understand the throne is a mercy throne. Not only that, I understand that mercy brings answers to prayers speedily. Not only that, mercy will charge my faith to get whatever I want. Have mercy as you believe. So if I put mercy towards the thing I need, he says you already got it. So mercy means I don't deserve anything. I deserve to be dead. But have mercy on me. Oh well. Before we go home tonight, we will get it. So uh, let's go to two chapters. Exodus chapter 25. And let's combine it with Hebrews chapter 4. Exodus 25 combined with Hebrews chapter 4. Kubis, why come God would answer you so much and so quickly? Grace and mercy. 
Anybody ask me, I said, grace and mercy. This week again, spoke to somebody, said, two years ago, May month, the 25th, we were in Ireland there on uh, Mount Slemish where St. Patrick, the patron saint of Ireland, was, was a slave in 300 AD. And uh, walking up Mount Slemish, me and John Wasserman was there with our family and stuff. And uh, God spoke to me so clearly. He said, you really understand my grace. You're on the way to understand my mercy. The day you understand my grace and mercy, I will teach you my love. If you understand my love, you'll have the bond of perfection and nothing shall be impossible to you. True, true, true. God said to me so clearly, I stopped and I said it to John. I said, John, let me tell you what God just told me. See, God said, you understand my grace. Because for five years I've been teaching grace, 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 grace. And then the last year, that was 2005, I started teaching mercy. God says, you're starting to understand my mercy. The minute you understand my grace and my mercy, I will teach you my love. Okay, I'll tell you right again. I will teach you my love. And when you have my love, you have the bond of perfection. What is that? The perfection. What is perfection? Maturity. I mean, I will lack nothing. I will short nothing. It will be, the thought will be the answer. Try it again. The thought would be the answer. Because love is the bond of perfection. He that does not stumble in word is a perfect man. You know? And how can I not stumble by being perfected in love? When I was a child, I thought as a child. But then we, we, when that which is perfect is come, I laid off the things of a child. What is, what is perfection? If I have, can speak in tongues of men and angels and have not love. If I give my body over to be burned and have not love. If I have all revelation and all knowledge and have not love. So what must I have? Love. Now abideth faith, hope, and love. But the greatest is love. If I have love, all the others work. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love. Then it's got attributes. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, temperance, faith. You know. But what is it? Love. Whatever. So, Exodus 25. I hope this is alright for tonight. I got other stuff. If you're not happy with this one, we can do another message. But it's too late, too late now, so we'll just stick with this one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, this is the thing that the Bible says the ark of testimony was with the children of Israel from Moses to David. And David longed to build a house for this ark for God, but God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Okay, And God said we shall not remember the ark, revisit the ark, rebuild the ark, because God wants to be present in our midst. But the ark was still the resemblance of God's presence in the Old Testament. Okay, So the ark was more than just a box they carried. Listen to what it was. Chapter 25. Let's start with, with verse 10 and just read as far as we can. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shall thou overlay it, and thou shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. I just thought somebody would notice the word crown there. Okay, so the ark had to have a crown, resembling a throne. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. Thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, and thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. Thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. Now verse 17. Thou shalt make a mercy seat. Okay, it's got a crown, and it's got a seat. Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. Thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work, shall thou make it in the two ends of the mercy seat. 
Make one cherub on the one end, the other cherub on the other end, and even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another towards the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark... Oh, man. And there I will meet with you, and I will commune with you from above the mercy seat. Can anybody just say, wow, man. Wow. Now I can go on and on and on, and you can read on and on and on and on and on and on. But to me, this is awesome. I think last year at the pastor's conference, September, I touched on it, where James says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Remember the story? So, Judgment is the law. The law of Moses was inside the box. What was over the box? The mercy seat. So mercy is over the law. Mercy is over judgment. So anything that the law could not give you, mercy says you can have it now. So I can meet with God. Where? Where the crown is. What is that? A throne. What is it? A seat. What is the seat? Mercy seat. Come, we heard so much about God is about to judge the world. God is going to stand in front of God's judgment seat. What about introducing some people to God's mercy seat? What about taking people into the very presence of God? He says, I will establish my throne in mercy, not in judgment. So what is God trying to bring you? Mercy. What is God trying to shower upon you? Mercy. What is God trying to rain on you? Mercy. What is God trying to bring to you? Mercy. Thank you for the alertness and the awakeness and the, you know, excitement in the house. But if you can get the mercy of God, maybe you can get an answer to your prayer. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. This is the shortest Adonai meeting you'll ever had in all your life. Hmm? Wow, man. Mm. Let's read verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses, our infirmities, and the liability to the assaults of temptation. Now, I don't want to elaborate on that, but I think that's more or less Psalm 18 and Psalm 69. That's more or less David's life story. So, oh, God, I, I know how to miss it. Okay, of course, you don't know. You're always making it. But if you meet somebody that somehow, some along the way, miss it, David says, I know the misses as well as the makers. Okay? I can make it at times, but, oh, God, I miss it at times. Okay? All the holy ones, just keep your hands down. Okay? So... He says, we have a high priest that knows when we're weak, knows when we're liable to temptation. Are you always above temptation, rising, you're always floating high? Or is it sometimes something, oh, wrong? Huh? And then we get condemned because God will not allow us to be tested, you know, above what we can take humanly in temptation. And then we miss it and we think we, we are even weaker than human beings because we support him. Huh? Okay, I will not say anything, but... Uh, just look straight ahead. Okay. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities and the liability to the assaults of temptation, but one who has been tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sinning. Verse 16. Let us fearlessly, confidently, boldly, okay, fearlessly, confidently, boldly, fearlessly, confidently, boldly, draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners, that we may receive mercy. Amplified, say, for our failures, and that we might find grace to help in good time for every need, appropriate help, well-timed help, coming just when we need it. Can I read it once more? Let us then fearlessly, confidently, boldly draw near to the throne of grace. The throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners. That we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good time for every need. Appropriate help and well-timed help coming 
just when we need it. We know grace. We understand grace. By grace are we saved. By faith, it's not of ourselves. It's a gift to God. What about mercy? What about understand? If I go to that throne and understand God's grace, the thing He will give me is mercy. What does His mercy say? Go. You're free. You're delivered. You're healed. Whatever you need, the time is right. Because you come because of mercy, have what you want. That is it. Thank you for the excitement. But So let's all stand. I wrote a lot. Let's sing Mercy Seat or something. Yo, I wrote a lot tonight. Uh, yo, three lines. That was the longest message I've preached in ages. For those who, if you've never tuned into the Spirit Word channel, normally we go on till 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. But tonight everything was quick. Singing was quick. Offering was quick. Hmm? Right, let's, let's do mercy seat. This is what broke the revival out in Brownsville in 1995. Judgment stopped it. But we can break it through again by getting the mercy.